Thanks, Greg. Uh, my name's Elizabeth Wilson. Uh, I'm in the Department of Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies at Emory, and I'm delighted uh, to be chairing this session today. I'm just going to say a few words about our speakers um, and their current work and then uh, pass over to them. So Lauren Berlant is the George M. Pullman Distinguished Service Professor in the Department of English at the University of Chicago. Her work, as everyone here knows, has been enormously influential on the emergence and the vitality of queer theory, American studies, and affect theory. Her current project, uh, her, sorry, her current projects include collaborations with Katie Stewart on a project called The Hundreds, a collaboration with Sian Nye on a special issue of Critical Inquiry called Comedy and Issue. And she has more or less finished two books, yeah, two, two books more or less drafted. Um, the first of these is called On the Inconvenience of Other People, Essays on Ambivalence. And the second is called Humorlessness. Humorlessness. Katie Stewart is a professor in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Texas at Austin. Her experimental ethnographic writing, especially the wonderful ordinary affects, has shaped our thinking and has changed our orientation to the affectations of everyday life as well as this collaboration with Lauren called The Hundreds, which is what they're going to speak to today. Uh, Katie is working on a project called Worlding, which she describes as an ethnographic writing experiment of short essays in post-phenomenology. So Lauren and Katie are going to speak back and forth, back and forth for 45, 50 minutes, um, and then we will take some questions. So please join me in uh, welcoming our speakers today. Hi. Hi. Once upon a time, a dog wandering on the dirt took a shit that turned out to be a big baby, crying from, <laughs> crying from despair at its uselessness. And even though, even though by the end we knew that everything would be okay because the shit would turn into compost, it was sad. These days, even a shit has to enter the workforce. Even a flower petal's got to produce something. I've got a darkish mind. I need half a break. There's no getting around the object or unsaying a thing or unseeing what floats by and sits for a spell. Should I attach footnotes to this poem to name the concepts it floats and the conversations it's having? It would take 15 minutes to say it all. The Korean cartoon called Doggy Poo, postscripts on the societies of control, Peter Linebaugh's the Magna Carta Manifesto, the legacies of imagism, and an earworm that includes the phrase, everything is going to be all right, whose specific origin I can't locate. But in the process of seeking it out, I learned that hundreds of songs contain this exact phrase. <laughs> the prose poems we sample in this talk come from a longer poetic and noetic collaboration that we call The Hundreds. This project focuses on the arts of attention to scenes that remain at once still and hovering while embedded in the flow of things, as Katie might write it. We look at the ways substances and disturbances in the world find episodic and unstable form, as I would write it. To convert the object into a scene while organizing attention is to retain a scene status as life in suspension, the way an extract in cooking conveys the active element in a concentrated substance that comes in a small brown bottle. This is vanilla. This is almond. The elaboration of form on the move points to pattern, patina, atmosphere, Vestiges that, by extension, offer an enigma even when what's seen, felt, and desired is an anchoring tableau. We get it. You want a home. You want to know what happened when the glances passed or what the cause of death was. As we proceed, we develop styles that mix figurative types into a resonance of relation that winnows effects into differentials. Our styles move in proximity to other things that are also moving. This is a practice of loosening up the object seen in hundred word swatches. Matter poems. Little thought tunnels pull form, event, matter into line, but they're easily outperformed with the heavy words, culture, politics, history. That doesn't mean they're lightweights though, just that they're singularities capable of doing things. By the end of the school year, loud noises in the house made me jump. I couldn't bear anything. 
When a friend described the same symptoms as traffic plus work plus mommy PTSD, I knew it was a thing. Now, in the traffic-free North Woods, I'm afraid of hitting moose on the road just because signs warn of moose crossings with some reference to death. And in the lake, the light green water and sandy bottom give way to darkness. The waves pick up. The bite of the spawning pickerel can draw blood. It only took a few repetitions for scenes at the Walmart of scruffy middle-aged men with elderly mothers buying them food and clothing to become a form referencing a problematic. Some things etch into you like tree sap baked onto a windshield over a triple digit month in Texas. You wouldn't think of putting your old stuff out on the street or that's exactly what you do. Then you watch to see what happens. Someone who stops will look to see if there will be objections, some information or a missing screw some sign of goodwill or irritation. An opportunity stained with social caste creates a problematic of contact. This summer, sensory paraphernalia bloomed like algae, while ecological collapse shag carpeted the earth in a thick mat of simulacra and romanticism. Melodramas of mixed ontological status hit swells. Austin's extreme El Nino replaced end-stage drought with two months of bad, bad rain. People on vacation, in vacation cabins washed downriver on a lethal 10-mile ride. In North Carolina, sharks bit off t nine teenagers' limbs over two weeks, and then they were gone. One kid fought off his shark with hard punches, as he had heard he should do, but the shark just took his other arm. There were, t there were attacks at the same time on Cape Cod, too. Something going on with the Atlantic. I saw a woman standing on a sidewalk in downtown Laconia, chain smoking while she talked to a buff, youngish man. She was trying to get him to give someone else a break because he means well, or he didn't mean it, or there are circumstances, maybe her son. He didn't know no better. She was hanging in there, but someone had some explaining to do and the whole top of her black hair was a helmet of white roots, a matter poem. Two, playing and reality. In this series, we write encounters through scenes that produce, as Prince would say, a few turbulence along the way. In the flow of things, or since this is affect, the flow of dings, <laughs> we create temporary ding for structures that allow for differentials to run all over the place and become qualities, qualia raised to some nth. Someone else, even me a little while ago, might call this ambition a method for tracking the becoming event of impacts. But now I prefer the idea of a non-ekphrastic relation to ding for structure. Description stages a feel and a twist, a turn in the weather's direction. Two hundreds about weather. A place in Chicago looks like Amsterdam. Clean air as, as if it is always just rained, with seating areas covered so that the river can be enjoyed. On the water, bags and boats float. White rock music from the year of my divorce echoes in the dark and light greenness of everything under the gray sky. It feels like a best color has been achieved. Workers smoke here. Lapping noises and a breeze too cool for summer make the rust on the nearby warehouse seem okay. Writing outside in the extended adolescence of an undecided dusk seems okay. The ducks glide nonchalant. It wasn't supposed to rain till tomorrow, but the tornado warning is sounding now. And behind the clouds, lightning twizzles as though somewhere in the higher frequency, there is a whole different causality. Meanwhile, in the undercommons, Moten and Harney call for black study from within the noise of the world so we can reach another one to live in but I'm still grabbing for the living every day and every other day. I don't know how to receive the future. To say that all words fail their object is not the same thing as saying there are no words. The sound of a wording. Writing in 100 pieces turned us into hyperactive haiku makers. Anything could seem like an incipient tendency. 
Lauren was pursuing the collapse of dissociation and association in sharply angled thought feelings with a surprise funny. While I was becoming a minimalist with words, looking for points of precision to pull things into what Isabella Stengers calls a vivid pragmatics. More than anything, I heard their sound, as if I could perform their mood through their tone and rhythm. I found myself in a contact aesthetic I learned from Jason Pine and piano lessons. That smell of the earthy oils the piano teacher wore and the way she ran her hand up the page of the music, opening it flat without catching her skin on the staples. I had an ambition just to register what happens, which is a lot. But also, everything started to seem like a reiterative experiment people had gotten into for whatever reason. The too muchness of everything was also a deficiency, but not something to sneer at. I fall into step on the sidewalk behind a family of five, including an extremely thin blonde grandmother who has the gnawed face of a meth addict or otherwise very sick person. She lopes when she walks, pulling her long limbs from behind. She places each footstep way out in front of her. Her head leads the effort, swinging from side to side like a dinosaur, her eyes cutting back over her shoulders. Her arms move out and around in circles a little randomly. Her shoulders are rigid and straight across the back like a hardcore alcoholic's. It's as if she's been torn limb from limb, and now she suddenly finds herself on a trip to the outlet mall with her daughter's family. Her shorts are ironed. She has nice sandals. She's a pterodactyl, a body double. What's happening to her body reminds me of someone's mother I've met a few times at a gathering at the beach. She has the lopping limbs, too. She's so anxious she can't really talk or venture out, but she wants to, and she once did. She only eats a few vegetables now. I stand next to her at Thanksgiving dinner. We start off pretty well, talking about books and travel and how we know people in the room. But after 20 minutes, we're in a trap, and I have to be the one to awkwardly and very deliberately drift away, releasing us from this. But now, we're pulled into a ricocheting ping of some big backlog of social failures. The next three days are tweaked by the occasional furtive look or a sharp turn on the poolside pavement to avoid contact. We have no bad feelings for each other, but bad feelings are literally between us, gluing our sympathies to an attending gap that hypes up our hypervigilance disorders. Three. Rhyming is such sweet jamming. This experiment is often startled by the moat of a situation, and we rest there speculating. A moat might be a passive-aggressive punctum. If our description produces movement, though, it's not seeking objectivity, but wondering how to get a bead on something, a pattern's relation to detail, a scene's gray area, or the tender, violent, dissociative explosion when a structure is faced as a visceral abstraction. Try to write down what you're thinking now and watch what sticks and what gets lost. You might have hoped that your mind would hold and relinquish both you and the right things. But even rhythm is a dream of a beautiful justness. Suicidiation Nation. My spell check says that any way to spell suicidiation is wrong. <laughs> it is wrong that we walk into walls for life, that we type with broken wrists, that the soundtrack to the day is an engine scraping the last oil off its crevices, that the small voice barely heard in the grinding will break itself up to feel approximately free, that to appear healthy, a gummed up drive will surely reappear as desire. Most of us are not crazy. Yet if we recorded the rants that moved through our heads while we wait at intersections, we'd be blown away by the police for conspiracy. How do we make a Lego from the bundle of tirades, or Lincoln logs from them, or twisted twigs from them of a paper so brittle it could fuel a fire? We are flinging ourselves at the encounter to catch its leakage with our mouths. If we blow, it's not evidence we were more broken than the other dangling modifiers and shattered loves. 
Each morning, the existential question of breakfast allegorizes the being in life of the life form of the day. Nothing is habitual or utopian enough to make the beat of attrition go away. Meanwhile, back on the ranch. <laughs> it's been a week since the tropical storm hit the island. High tide is at our door. The sanderlings are still running back and forth in the yards as if they think they're racing in and out of the surf. The bed at the beach had given me a neck headache. The sheets and carpeting were sticky wet with humidity. I threw open the bank of windows to let in the wind, but the air in the room just swelled asthmatically. The sky over the ocean was a blotchy black and green, like bruises on fat. There was a message on my cell phone from Fran's daughter, Mimi. I called her back. She has a singer's voice. We talked in conspiratorial tones. Pop is frail. Fran, Fran is losing her mind. Mimi says, you think, okay, she's like a 12-year-old, but really, now, she's five. Oh, you'd never know it. Yes, her social skills are beautiful. Fran tells me that she buys her clothes from catalogs now. She married a man because they both liked to dance, but he was way more work than the four kids combined. She says her daddy was a Presbyterian minister and he made a different kind of ice cream every night, the neighborhood kids peering around the corner of the porch to see if it was ready yet. Every kind worked except the watermelon. Meanwhile, back on the academic ranch, the death maws of humanist critique just keep snapping at the world as if the whole point of being and thinking is just to catch it in a lie. <clears throat> as if some fixative of state science or normative fantasy could be the only problem. And there's that old puss-faced conviction that there's something wrong with people in general. Some of the things this view misses. All the extensions of ways of being touched, the lines of things on the move, the widespread joking, the voicing, the dark wakefulness, the sonorousness, how managing a life vies with an unwitting ungluing, how things get started, how people try to bring things to an end, especially the day, through things that slide or slam or in marathon serial immersions, why thought as such might become an add-on or window dressing, why conceptuality might take the form of a speed list, condensing incommensurate elements into something ungainly but recognizable, or why it matters that attention sometimes slows to a halt to wait for something to take shape. Four, curiosity. To focus on the suspended life within a live action schema is not to refuse judgment or to claim a radical alterity or contingency for our thought. What a bore. We are tilted toward getting at things. Venus as a boy, the flood of action in a scene, or those times when what looks like inaction might be holding up the world in the double sense of holding as infrastructure and blockage. Sentimentalists would call this kind of being in relation curiosity, but that uniform reeks of a fake generosity and denies the aggression that pressures the attention drive of scholars and neighbors. The icing on the cake. I am the girl who sits by the fire whether or not it's cold. The three kids at the next table are clearly siblings stealing joyously from each other's plates. Their eyebrows are noticeably thin. Each set spans longer than the next from eye length to curving toward the temples. They are young and their teeth are tiny squares. One kid is having a birthday and a large cupcake arrives with a candle to much clapping and singing. After the silent beat of the wish, they all blow because everyone wants that wish to have a shot at coming true. Draw a storyboard of this scene. What are the genders and races of these children and their muffin delivering adults? Presuming they live in the USA, how big or cropped is their hair? Are they all dressed alike? Do the generations shift? Does birthday cupcake suggest a budget, a festive excess, or what? Are the surrounding tables paying attention or merely penetrated by the family's unavoidable noise? Is it sunny out? 
Can you explain what it is about icing that links it to a joy beyond measure? <laughs> what about politics? Icing was a treat only for royals before refined sugar developed its market. Worlding, one. Howie Becker says a world is real people trying to get things done, mostly by getting other people to do things. <laughs> Looking for applause, we put on the best show we can in a collective activity that perhaps no one wanted, but it's the best everyone could get out of the situation and therefore what they all, in effect, agreed to. A milieu not only attunes you to what's going on, but moves you to initiate, imitate, and elaborate skilled lines of action. Jazz musicians are supposed to smoke dope. Graduate students learn how to please their professors. <laughs> we pivot like method actors on the nub of a detail, the pain in a hip, your hair akimbo. For Al Pacino, the point is to get into a state that brings about freedom and expression and the unconscious. Something tweaks the muscles of voice or posture to build something from the inside out. Then, maybe after months of learning how to walk or following strangers around because of some mannerism that seems right, Pacino becomes the character, maybe only at the last minute when the camera finally prompts the coagulation of the thing. The concept itself can also be a kind of method acting, as Lauren has shown. Some set of forms and performances hit a literal metaphorical state of mind, or the vocal cords, or they become a facial tick, or take off, surfacing eccentrically, but for reasons. This might happen the way advice surfaces from the floaty, fakey depth of a magic eight ball. Or it might be more like the way a concept surfaces in a writing workshop when, after listening to three or four or five hundred word pieces performed, the room becomes a play surface or a method voicing of things becoming concepts. Toying with things is critical to the game of social poesis. That means you can also get into a real or a realism you may or may not actually need or want a realm of irritation and missed beats or an overly enthusiastic appropriation might enter the picture. One of the things that gets me is friends who forget that the clothes or books they borrowed are not actually theirs. <laughs> There's no getting to the bottom of a thing like this, though you might have a passing fantasy of documenting what actually happened. But whatever you do, you're acting in the script they started. And even if you set out on your own, there's always some speculative recovery to get in your way, or a stance to get you going, or something revenant in things you now have to pay attention to. Maybe there was a moment when this kind of attentive formulating became widespread. Thomas de Zengotita says the Kennedy assassination pushed the US into a wholesale performance mode it never came out of. Or people think modernism did it or the industrialization of experience, or cognitive capitalism now, or the way media drag us into things, one little image or sound at a time. Or there's always talk of the 50s, or the 30s. Or in academia, there was the time social constructionists became so attuned to the locked together mediation of everything that they spun circles around things like a broken record wearing grooves into matter. Five, after the event. These prose reflections on the hundreds also operate under a hundred word constraint. The stripping down is in the service of keeping the event open, not that we have a choice. Differentiation happens, and the question is how and how firmly. Maybe through the convenience of norms, our favorite takeout dinners, or any stimulation that extends to form. Like parapraxis, that slip of the mind so quick you can decide whether to call its products knowledge. I see writing as a kind of intestinal action, a thought I shoplifted from Jean Laplanche's classic riff, metabolizing the enigmatic signifier of love. Two dreams about love. In the dream, we took turns being inconvenient to each other, so the dream was good social theory. <laughs> It wasn't pleasant. We were bad at everything. 
tripping and banging into well-known corners. Inside, two black women and a white man our age made large, heavy sculptures impossible to see from any angle. It was a cooperative, and everyone took each other collegially. Our ginger cat climbed up the door and sat in the gap at the top. I became afraid to leave, to lose. The next day, the phone could pull up nothing, so we were stuck with approximate knowledge. I opened my hand, and a small cluster of people peered up at me out of it, silent and bug-eyed. I drew them out of my palm like taffy, but there was no snapping sound and no lost teeth. In a minute, the conference room buzzed harshly, wondering why it had bothered to show up for nothing but the chance for more something. I was lucky to be the dreamer, because the dreamer never stops being interested. People know when they haven't said enough, that's why they dream. Or, that's not why they dream, but why they continue loving. Worlding 2. Loosely linked social, aesthetic, political, and material registers tell a story about how some things come to matter and for whom. A display table of elements flashes erratically, like a light bulb going out. Partial tangibilities initiate a wandering through little bits of social compost or historical debris. In some moment of flatness or a tentative readying, a new ordinary takes place refracting an ecology of saturations. Forms of pleasure, abandonment, and transformative fucking around create zones of inhabitation out of identities, situations, genres, habits, attitudes, and recreational or therapeutic commonalities. Worlding is a way of venturing out. Anything can start to act like a hinge or a hammer or a detour. You walk your dog. You send your kid to a new school. Now you're a regular somewhere, or you're homeless, or transgendered, or from someplace, or your persona reenacts the Civil War or the Renaissance, or you get a kind of cancer or a disorder. There's an activation of the details of something now somehow at hand that you didn't know was there, but now sense. It may promise an identity confirmation or just a pit stop or maybe some ideological stranglehold incites its own hyper-attunement to the irritants coming at its ideal plane of the same. In a worlding, you have to keep your wits about you. You might learn to catch a passing quip or to turn your head away. There are opportunities for sincerity or snarkiness. There are receptivity mistakes, maybe the poise of a balancing act, at best, the fluidity of a perfect timing. The men at the Eloquoia store. I heard they were so right wing it would make your head spin. I expected them to be puffed up when I walked in, but they were wide open and mid grin. They had timing. We were from Texas. Texas, what a shithole. <laughs> Those people are nuts. If they can't see a hundred miles in every direction, they're miserable. <laughs> this guy who came here hated the trees. He said he couldn't see anything. Trees were always in the way. <laughs> we knew we were in the zone of stereotypes and first impressions, but that was what we were toying with. Amarillo, that place is like the surface of the moon. If there was oxygen on the moon, they'd all move there. These guys had moved to New Hampshire because they just liked it better than Lynn, Lynn, the city of sin. Then comes the butt. It's a Gestapo state. Don't drink and drive in this state. They'll take your license. And there it was. It took three minutes. They were calling out an obligation to a milieu I couldn't get into and didn't want to, but I felt the force and fear of something going on with the police. One way or another, you find yourself in something, or sort of. Some rote repetition, a mistaken impression, or a precise intuition drags lines of orientation into service, being in it or staying out of it, why this and not that, why her and not him, why me, why should I, what's in it? You find yourself suspended in an undertow of reluctance, or lodged in a partially compelling but never completely unfolded presence 
a kind of eye contact, or a tendency to warm up to strangers that only goes so far. Six, I'll try to keep myself open up to you. There is no realism insurance. The critical turn to agency, judgment, and science to assess action avoids what's central to affect, receptivity. Receptivity is an enduring experience, a problem, and Spinoza's affectus, which I first learned about from Michael Hart. It's the encounter where incidents begin mattering. Mattering is a way to talk about receiving. It's not just figuring openness and vulnerability to exposure then, but defenses too, which are not the opposite of receptivity, but the ways we can be with it. Only through attention to the circulation of penetration can we talk about the forces that forge form. Attachment frictions. On one side of the cafe, January, they talk loudly of her name, is on a date with a sweet internet hookup whose fingers are like tipperillos. And it's going so great for a while until January says no, in a slightly louder voice, no, I don't eat meat. It makes me feel bad. I won't even have plants. The guy loves meat. It's the only reason I see my father, he says. He cooks meat like no one. The conversation gets quiet and then turns away toward work and phrases like and whatnot spring up <laughs> until things get sweet and elliptical again. I have eight pairs of cockies and eight shirts, he says, so I never have to make a decision. My underwear is all sorts of colors, but that doesn't count, she says. I like to live simply and to look at her metal t-shirt and sweet flats with jeweled skulls embroidered on them. I get it. <laughs> they are trying to maintain. They already know how they'll fail because when they're not alike, their jaws get set. Santa over here wants to give them five pouches of patience and some Xanax to make it a test like in fairy tales. Outside in the sun, a couple that divorced a year ago has a date to make an inventory. Before the woman arrives, the man tells a friend he runs into that it's been a year since he's seen his ex. It's been entirely on email. The friend nods and walks off. The vestige tilts back in his chair, straightening when she arrives in a van. She's a foot taller than he is, wider too. There is no awkward hug, just the scraping of metal chairs. Both are gray pale, as though they hadn't gone outside since the apocalypse poisoned the air. Each ex has a piece of paper with penciled notes. I'd bet anything that their mediator or someone's shrink or sponsor suggested this tool so they could erase their bullshit if it showed up for a fight. <laughs> From the outside, they seem very tired. The woman is wearing big metal jewelry and the man a baseball cap backwards. I'll begin, she says. One, I was a narcissist. <laughs> then quiet. Things have gotten so bad, she re-begins, that I had to do an inventory with another friend too, and she made me admit it. I'm all about my own feelings. The guy gets sad and seems humiliated too that still a year later, he is profoundly passive in the air of her. He makes supportive noises. One, I had my stuff too, he mutters, looking at the paper. I tested you. We played games, she said. I wasn't trusting, he said. Two, also, she said, I owe you money. I took a lot from you when you were sleeping. <laughs> and she hits the table with a crushed ball of bills that scatter to the ground. Everyone on the outside rises and laughs, pretending to steal what wasn't ours or theirs. Townies. Worlding is an existential territory initiated by movements of concern. As townies, we had a loyalty to the expressivity of things. Eye contact pinged around the Dunkin' Donuts. We knew when a few pansies stuck in a window box was a failed gesture at spring and when it succeeded that a front porch slightly cluttered or too bare was not just the sign of a shut-in inside, but the actual matter of a slackening, as if the plastic siding long ago layered over the wood was itself necrotic. We felt the bony truth in the mantra that the beach is cold and gray in the winter and windy in a bad way. 
It was as if whatever there was to notice was already scored onto matter, but only sort of. The town line's patch of gray concrete held the promise of sentience itself. Race, class, and ethnicity hovered above it in the mode of the really real, as if the world literally burst into color on the home side and went gray in the instant of passing over the edge. And yet, the town line had to be breached. It stood as a faltering into a venturing out. We crossed it, alone and mapless, almost deliberately unprepared, in a kind of free fall, driving with our heads held straight ahead as if we had no necks. Things happened when you set out to get pita bread from the Lebanese place one town over and only one mile away. We were agoraphobes drawn to an edge. No one knew the names of streets, as if there was no circuit between the street signs our eyes must have seen and what we considered it our business to know. I remember seeing street signs a few times, but as a lonely surprise, and I can't put together a name and a street as if I'm still shielding my eyes, brain, from something that wasn't part of the picture for that towny we. Everything we did was a turning point ending up in a quagmire, and nothing ever happened without first registering a commitment to exhausting webs of complication, resource issues, and dark little tunnels of limited choice. That we relied not on intentionality or agency per se, but on the energy of small things made consequential for no conceivable reason. We were on the far out end of the mindfulness spectrum. It was as if the point of living was to spend ourselves on whatever was at hand. A taste for pecan sandies, the habit of wearing sandals in the snow. In the end, we ran a gamut of down-to-earth voicings as if running a gauntlet. It is what it is. That's enough of that. No more beer for you. No more talking to her. Seven, on free association as utopian aspiration. <laughs> Riffing is the first freedom, even more than lying. It's the first pattern play with the language thing. John Forster argues that lying is the first freedom, the thing children do when they see that language is an object they can use any way they want, even when they're not master of it. But lying is of a higher order in relation to its others, truth and silence. From the beginning, sound makes reverb and we're always assessing it, moving with the surprise of resonance as a membrane emerges, capturing and stretching over what proceeds to see what it knocks against and what happens then. The riff can induce some anxiety too, as the encounter with play forces facing the autonomy of a thing's rhythm of being in the world, a sense patch that's usually moved through without much friction. I love Masumi's use of patch as a space of time, as in, I'm going through a bad patch now, because it refers to the electrical connection among things. And I know I've been riffing on riffing. To talk riffing is to talk about the relation of play to the patterning we notice, and the pattering it doesn't matter if we notice. This week in Shakes, Monday. The protein drink is a chalky substance diluted and well enough flavored that a small store sample persuades you that you drink it at home. <laughs> Only to find at home that, no matter how much attention you'd paid at the time, you can't get the makeup to look as good or the hair to fall again the way it did at the original moment of optimism. <laughs> I had committed to two tubs of vegan breakfast powder. <laughs> One recalled the fleck of inhaled bugs, <laughs> and the other was a bully pushing my face down thoroughly into tough, wet dirt. <laughs> when it comes to experiments, I commit my mouth. Five months of unquenchably pasty tongue prison ran out finally. <laughs> and I hastened to acquire seven new shake packs full of promises and percentages. Today, Vega One All-in-One Nutritional Shake in French Vanilla, 50% of daily intake vitamins and minerals, 15 grams of protein, 6 grams of fiber, and 1.5 grams of omega-3, plus antioxidants, probiotics, and greens. Dairy, gluten, and soy 
free. <laughs> no sugar added and 135 calories. Complete daily essentials to help you thrive. Good for your body and the planet. Clean without compromise. The ampersand's shortcut efficiency figures negativity baroquely. My shake was green. The world has not wa enough water for everyone, nor amounts sufficient to dilute this shake so that its flavor could be rejoined at the party after the chaos of getting in, finding the room with the coats, and moving outside for a quick smoke. Vanilla is a tart baby when you drink it from the bottle and a teasing allusion if you bite the bark. Vanilla is also the sex you slide into, the pleasant event of that hand again there, or the feeling of feet arching. My tongue sought out but never landed. A return. I dream of going back. There's a river where the canyon used to be. A dozen people of all sizes and shapes are climbing up on each other's shoulders like cheerleaders. The guy in the middle holds a tow rope behind a speedboat. They take off. A heavy, older, blonde woman falls off the top of the triangle and does a perfect landing in only six inches of water. Some kind of brave and reckless flourishing. Then I'm visiting. There's no trash pickup every, every day, so every day I find a place to dump a bag. At the boardwalk, outside the supermarket where the cashiers take their cigarette breaks, at a rest area, a restaurant, I have to case out places, rush in and out, a victory, a guilty fear. The signs on every trash can and dumpster announce that violators will be prosecuted. But no local would pay for trash. I'm bossier here. I'm talking again about bed bugs and cockroaches and the horror of a heat wave. I remember that toasters have to be unplugged when you leave the house. I see the outline of laughable topic, topics that lead from the gut. Peg and George shove grocery bags into the back of their shorts to walk the dogs. George perks up when I tell him that Ron buys doggy bags. What? How much does he pay for them? I say, well, there's a law against plastic bags in Austin. Well, duh, yeah, it's only a matter of time here, too. But that's why I get them to double bag my groceries. <laughs> George is serious, but he takes my laugh in stride. I wonder how, how long I can go on like this. It's fun to tweak a regional nerve, but I'm starting to want to branch out on my own. At the hotel, an egg cooking machine is driving me crazy. There's one dial for temperature and another for time. You lower your egg into eggs into one of two baskets of steaming water. I keep opening still raw eggs and throwing them away with loud sound effects. <laughs> Others are getting upset that their eggs are getting mixed up. Finally, I notice there's a huge sign with detailed operating instructions. <laughs> But we've all already had enough of all this, poised between a fuck you shrug and an eye roll. All summer there were surreal wedding scenes of bridesmaids in yellow and lavender floating down to the harbor along the brick sidewalk. A bride standing in her dress on a dock, waiting. Groomsmen clumped in black formality. Suspensions in the mode of pause poise, and pose. Eight, couldn't bust a grape in a fruit fight. <laughs> we are distributed across encounters. We're so distributed that we might take in everything without noticing anything except whatever sticks when the radical passivity of our general central openness is interrupted by an impact that demands to take shape. I've suggested that style is a relation between receptivity and defense but it can be traumatic to experience autonomous life, the life not addressed to one. It points to elbow room without walls and the relay of consequences. Resilience is the long-term effect of receptivity's question, what happened? Something happened and is already in us, yet it still feels like the question, how can we take it in, is a real question. But that's a misprism of the situation, and the misprism is a misprision. Style is the touch of the world on the pattern-reacting body. It's the pattern you make to organize distraction and attention. It's a political thing, too, as anyone knows whom the world insults insistently with figural foreclosures. 
Without style, you cannot coast. Without coasting, you cannot live. Of course, the nervous system has its own circuit breakers. Unfortunately, the circuit breaker has no circuit breaker, and sometimes it itself uses itself up by making itself up. Some morning demons. Porridge. We are all tired in a row, slouching in our humped coats. Mothers crouch to feed their children little spoons of yogurt. Adults read while digging oatmeal from small cardboard boxes. A few people say, fuck it, aloud, and down the second donut. Cops trundle in, jostling, loud. One of them asks if he can have a bit of the hand cream I've just pulled out. I grin, and with a thrust of fake chagrin, and things seem easy for a second. Stranger gazing is a membrane that stretches things out as though I were constantly vomiting but had no mouth. Blueberries. That poor woman, the breakfast blueberries she ate stained everything and she knew nothing of it. Thinking she was healthy and bursting with pride, she'd chosen a good sugar. At the bus stop, a little girl got a big smile. At work, the mood was lively, lots of joking around. For a living, she counsels PTSD sufferers, offering a week of playing with horses. We provide the housing, you just pay the transportation. At two, she went to fix her face and things turned sharply dark. A simple embarrassment floods into a sense that there is only to be that unloved. The New Ordinary is an awkward accretion of bits and pieces you may or may not take to. A continuous recursivity of modifications and reciprocities that produce little pop-outs and lines of overuse. A collective search engine, not a grammar. Households. I take a walk. At first, the houses are a little disheveled and bruised. The yards are piles of split wood, pine needles, axes, and chainsaws, coolers, pickups, campers, and boats, a fire pit, a shed. Inside, via the app Trulia, there's green carpeting and bareness tipping into an almost hoarding of inadequate closets. An aesthetic aimed at filling in the empty spaces overwhelms itself. Decorations manically thrown at a wall, baskets crammed along the tops of the kitchen cabinets. It's a realism half realized and half succumbed to. Sometimes there are piles of plastic boxes in a corner of the living room or spilling out over the couch and onto the floor, littering the living with something not right, as if the things can't stand up anymore. Painfully steep stairs lead to, to tiny upstairs bedrooms painted hyper-bright colors in paint so flat it makes my fingertips dry. Here, there's just dull, dark, oversized furniture, or again, the collapsed piles that started by the windows. All a smudging in the photos, a thing repeated on site after site. I imagine they drew the line at paying for professional photographs, but then, what happened next? Now concepts are rooms full of scraps that might be prolonged or sounded out. There are fugitive presences. Memories are debris coming at lines already skirted by danger and a dull light. Peg remembers that our mother made us get short haircuts when we were kids because it was easier to take care of. All I know is that when my hair is cut short, it's chaotic. What I remember is the humiliation of the high school yearbook picture with the parted hair poofed up on one side. And that only because the picture showed up at the bottom of a box 30 years later. Anxiety made a nest in her. A man screamed at Ariana for having the dog off the leash. We made jokes about it. He's a crab face. Everybody else likes the dogs but she's not taking any chances. Now she's afraid to cross the street, afraid to get out of the car at miniature golf, afraid to walk around the shoe store to see if the shoes fit because there might be a rule against it. She demands to see the rules before she'll stand up. Are they written down somewhere? She thinks we're rule breakers who will get her in trouble. She's on her own and disoriented. My fear of the girl's anxiety makes me snap at her. Are you kidding me? Get a move on. 
In Philly, we get caught in a violent thunderstorm and run through the rain. She's screaming. Back at the hotel, she cracks wide open, her mouth full of ice cream. She can't stop laughing. Plus, she just got a thousand likes on some new site for a haiku she wrote about how life is worth something and we should take it seriously. <laughs> She's thrilled about this. All the likes just popping up all of a sudden and she's wondering what this is about. Nine. Ask the wind, the wave, the star, the bird, the clock, everything that is flying, everything that is groaning. A fault is an open seam one might fall into, an inconsistency that one nonetheless walks through, although the structure is flawed. As Jasper Puar writes, to assemble incapacity and action, is to get at what might be a form of life. In times of general crumbling, the democracy of fissures is both structural and ordinary. Macroaggressions induce death, induce death, rhetoric, and the historical sense. Microaggressions are painful because they induce microadjustments. Microadjustments exhaust the best of our juice, creativity, and attachment to life. Microadjustments are also life the wandering and slight shocks of touch and the exciting brush of incessant phrasing. What's the difference between the political bruise and the ever demand of relation? Plus, there's a craving to be inattentive. We want the hundreds mode to allow all the possible tones of mouth for making something known. Its citational tributaries mark what other minds are still teaching us to take in, not to capture, of their specific pacing. In that way, the scenes of encounter that draw our attention have the self-violating finish of speculation and the loose solidity of gesture. Every figuration is an opening and a defense, an attempt not to fall down, an attempt to hold out. What does Webster say about soul? Everyone in this cafe is casual. The whole neighborhood is, except at five when the suits with product hair come in to put off going home. At the next table, Two women and a man are wearing the same jean and sweater outfits, pretty much. One woman's hair is tousled faux carelessly, and the other's is drawn into a ponytail. The man sports a baseball cap. Ponytail opens a large white box, inside of which are three perfectly round cakes, frosted white. A wedding is being planned. One cake is covered with the white sugar pearls we associate with festive decoration, the kind of thing that, life, that like life, is supposed to taste good, but might break your teeth. One woman tastes the cake, and the other talks and waves her hands. The man gestures towards the tousled blonde as if to say her happiness is all that matters. The salmon sweater of the consumer has more texture than the green top of the provider. Pictures are taken of the cakes to send to someone's mother. The baker wants to know if the cake will go on a stand. She gestures at face height and higher. The couple throws its brow at the gesture. Collective sensibilities keep you company, but only a little bit. We get a lot of practice in bearing light returns and the reiterative re-upping of the details at hand. Most people seem to be in the middle of something we somehow ended up in. Ron collects things to kickstart himself. He sees the collecting as a straight up stage in the creative process. The things gather themselves into companionable clumps. Fishing rods with reels and hooks and flies, jewelry making beads and silvers, leather working needles and oils, guitars with their strings and song lists and capos and stands, hats kept upside down on the tops of bookshelves, boots with their inserts, stretchers and polishes, knives with cases and sharpeners, fountain pens with their jaw, jars of ink and methods of cleaning, acrylic paints with rolls of canvas and paper, a dozen large pitchers full of brushes, books everywhere, their bookmarks, the reading lights that hook onto their covers or hang on the bed frame, magnifying lenses with lights and book stands so your hands are free to do what the book is telling you to do. He buries himself in routines of care and repair Painting, music, and writing recede behind a wall. His thinking becomes catalogic. He reads catalogs, 
filing the details of springs and cabinet hardware in his brain. There's some peace in this, but it's prolific too. He has favorite companies. He mail orders more things. He decides to build a racing bike, and every day more and bigger boxes start arriving. He needs a certain kind of screw he can't find. He picks at his cuticles. He's poised in a trap, like the quarters in the rip-off machine that seem like they'll all tumble out if you just put one more in the slot. Anything else that comes at him is an attack on his concentration. He has learned to become perfectly still. There's always someone to blame if things happen. Everything sets off hours of searching for a missing tool, but this gives way to treasures discovered. Scenes that once held promise and now hold the memory of a pulse. 10. Every crisis is also a moment of reconstruction. It's no accident that Katie and I wrote the hundreds against some literal-minded exploration of the ordinary. Kidding. <laughs> I love it when people say, it is no accident that. They've got causality all sewn up. Katie writes long, flowy things and edits. I cut the shit out of verse as I write. Sometimes in edit, the forms splinter, and other times they bind concepts like a blister's casing. Sometimes what we write is boring, like hearing someone's dream go, and then, and then. <laughs> Sometimes it's arresting, but it's not always fun either to be hooked. Nonetheless, compelled receptivity is an unfreedom one has to do something with. So when I type the Yiddishism noives, which handcuffs stress to comedy, Autocorrect insists that I intended noise, which would change what the index of this book would direct you to see. An index induces connotation further than the book's sentences. In the paper version, we're therefore leaving pages for people to experiment with, turning their senses into theorists. Theory is always propositional. Katie is an ethnographer, and I write story problems. We are on multiple moving sidewalks that come to an end in the hundred, without the walking coming to an end. Not only that, but, but, but my mother stole the money from it from the back, wait. Not only that, but my mother stole the money for it from the back of my father's checkbook. My car lived like the furniture in the bluest eye that tore just as the poor took possession of it, never to be enjoyed unalloyed. It was yellow like the clouded eyes people crammed with cholesterol get. It was my other freedom when the first option was only to undress. When your car dies, it turns out that you have to find a new person too. That's a rule. On the horizon, there's sunlight, and the world runs toward you calling your name, and that's also happiness. Some people slot kids into that image, and others other things, and others nothing. Thank you.